I've been in companies where there was a number and it wasn't hit and everyone is pointing fingers everywhere, right? And I've heard plenty of uh, stories of that type of thing also. And when everyone is pointing fingers, no one is pointing at, at back at the top of the mountain and saying, how do we get there? So if you are willing to take on the responsibility for it, suddenly all the finger pointing goes away. What are they going to do? They point their finger at you, right? And then you get to point your finger at the mountain. It, it really uh, gives you a lot of influence. Again, if you have the track record of being very successful and being a high performer and focusing on the most valuable things, it gives you a lot of influence to say, stop talking about whose fault this is. It's my fault. Now let's fix it. Hello and welcome to the Delivering Value Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Kaplan. I got a dope guest for you on this episode. We're chatting with Benjamin Elias. He is the VP of Marketing at Podia, which is actually the product that I personally use to host a lot of my course programs. And Benjamin just recently got promoted to VP of Marketing. He previously was a Director of Growth Marketing there. He was Director of Growth Marketing and a whole bunch of other stuff during his time at Active Campaign. And he's someone who's written extensively about leadership challenges, and all the crazy stuff that happens when you work at early stage tech companies on his Substack, which we'll link to in the show show notes below. But in Benjamin and my conversation, we tackled all kinds of stuff from mental models to navigating high growth organizations. We talked about making mistakes at work and how you can use those mistakes to grow your influence, not shrink your influence. We talked about the best kind of feedback to get and how to go about seeking out that feedback tactically. And we got into growth leadership what it takes to be an amazing leader in tech and how to become one. I think you're going to love our conversation. Let's, let's just go ahead and jump right in. Want to take a second and thank Mad Kudu for sponsoring the show. The average SaaS business has a hybrid motion these days. You know, when I was head of growth at Wistit and at Postscript, although we called ourselves PLG, there was a sales team at both companies. Both companies did some outbound. We did inbound. There was the product-led freemium or free trial motion and wrangling all that stuff to understand lead scoring and quality and PQL routing is a bear. And when I worked at PostScript, we had a Stanford PhD, had a PhD in data science, one of the smartest people I've ever met, spend weeks and weeks and weeks putting together this insane predictive model using our behavioral data to understand who was likely to convert and to upgrade. And it took weeks of doing this. We weren't really able to adjust it after the fact, and it ended up being something that was hard to maintain. And what's great is that now there's these whole suite of tools out there that can help you do this way faster. So Madkudu is typically the one that I send my clients to that if I had in my previous world, those head of growth would have made my life way easier. And what's nice is that they balance the hybrid motion really well. So if you're trying to wrangle PQLs, PQAs, and figure out lead scoring across your hybrid model, check out Madkudu. It's where I send my clients. This episode of the Delivering Value podcast is brought to you by Novatic. If you're listening to this and you have followed me online, it should be no surprise that Novatic is a sponsor. Talk about the interactive demo space all the time. As a former two-time head of growth, I learned pretty quickly that there's a huge percentage of signups that create an account, poke around for a couple minutes, and leave and never come back. If you survey these folks, they usually say, hey, I just wanted to see the product in action for a few minutes. I'm not ready to buy. I don't want to upload my stuff. I just wanted to see it. And so creating some version of your product that's ungated, that people can play with on your website, tends to be super helpful for that population of people. It increases the quality of your users. It weeds out all the clunkers, so from clouding up your data, and it starts the onboarding process way before someone even gets into the product. It's a huge part of the growth operating system, and if you're looking for help building this, so you don't have to take months and months doing it in-house like my engineers did, use Novatic. They create third-party tools that help you do exactly this. I send a lot of my advising clients their way, and they're a great product. For those who aren't familiar with your journey, And obviously we can look at your LinkedIn and get a feel for just your, the bullet points of your resume, but I'm curious to know, I know you just recently got promoted to VP of marketing, but you identify and have a background in growth. How did you first get into that world? What's your growth origin story? To tell the story, I would go all the way back to undergrad where I majored in psychology and the whole time I was in school, I thought my path was going to be undergrad psychology grad school psychology, professor of psychology, never leave college. I just love it, I guess. Uh, (laughs) And when I was in my third year of undergrad, I was doing research with all of the stuff that I did. I didn't do any internships. I didn't do any anything business or marketing related. I did research in labs. And I didn't like it that much. 
But when I graduated, I was like, oh, no, <laughs> I have no skills that anyone would pay me for because I don't want to do the thing that I thought I wanted to do this whole time. So I just took anything I could get my hands on. Uh, I did think that marketing was probably the path. I was thinking, OK, well, psychology, what's applied psychology? That was what I didn't like about the lab. It was not actionable enough. It wasn't that we were doing things. I had to sit in a room and run 100 participants through a survey. It's not a super fun thing to do. And that's like what you do for at least seven years if you go the grad school route. And marketing to me seemed like it was applied psychology. I'm glad that I feel like I was right about that because I didn't really know anything going in. But I just took anything I could get my hands on. I did my first online writing thing was writing analysis of Ultimate Frisbee teams for Ulti World. And I did that a little bit while I was in college. And then I took a couple of free internships, the unpaid. I did a, a nonprofit internship for uh, something that was focused on helping millennials save money. That was like PR social. I did a cold sales internship for a small SaaS company. That was not the most fun. I don't super love cold sales, it turns out. And the people who do that well are, are unicorns, I think. But I really just took anything I could do, any work, anything that I could get on my resume until finally I was able to get a full-time, like real internship paid $12 an hour at a marketing agency that focused on the life sciences and science in general. And that was my in there was, okay, I got some marketing and I've done these internships and I have a science degree so I can ostensibly talk about science things, even though we were talking about like biology pharmaceuticals, things that I didn't really know anything about. After about a month into that three month internship, they brought me on full time to do content marketing. And I remember they said, you're going to do content. I was like, what's content? I didn't know. What content <laughs> yeah. marketing was. And like, what year is this just for reference? Uh, that was in 2015. Right. So 2015, when I mean, content marketing was really flourishing then. But like, yeah, you know, when you're new rise. to the space, right, when you're yeah. new to the space and you haven't read 40 HubSpot articles explaining content marketing, you know, using content marketing to explain content marketing, it's all, it's all new and unknown, right? Exactly. And I didn't really appreciate how much of a field this was. They said, oh, you're going to do content marketing. I was like, oh, okay, what's content marketing? And, and why, why am I doing it? They said, oh, well, you can sort of write. And I was like, I can? I didn't know that that was a skill that people would pay for. I, I undervalued that as a, I just thought everyone wrote and that's what happened in the world. When I came on and learned about this new field, I wanted to learn everything I could about it. I was, I did what most people do, which is start with HubSpot and Neil Patel and read everything that there was about it and read all the case studies that have 362.1% improvement to whatever, whatever metric. And eventually I realized working with clients a lot, I don't get to see the full end to end. I really need to start something on my own to set up the website and do the copywriting and do the email and the nurture and the, the lead magnets and the SEO and the analytics and everything. So I started a website. It's still up. Uh, I don't really write for it anymore. I haven't in like five years now, but uh, it's called Routine Excellence. The pitch was, how can you get into the gym more consistently in a way that makes you feel good? and not terrible. And I used my psychology background to do that. So I, I saw I'm an avid gym goer and I would see all the time, especially after New Year's, people come in, do these super intense workouts that had to have them feeling terrible the next day, which is like textbook. You're punishing yourself essentially for doing a thing that you want to do. So if you feel and that's terrible- that's what's happening right now, right? So we're filming this, it's mid-February, the yeah. gym is packed. The right? gym is like, packed. What's happening exactly. today. And, and and it didn't have to be that way. Uh, there's all sorts of anxiety and uncertainty and all these these things that you can address if you take a different approach to what hustle culture says the gym should be. And that's what I wrote about. And that website blew up immediately. The first website, uh, the first article uh, was a 4,000 word guide because uh, that's what Neil Patel and HubSpot said I had to do. But it Classic. worked and it blew up on Reddit and brought in like a quarter of a million or so people in the first week. Yeah, it was a lot. Um, That's insane. Yeah. And, the, and all three of the, the first three posts all blew up on Reddit. And, you know, it was a good way to get started. A little anxiety yeah, at, yeah. at the beginning. But it, it spoke to, I had done, done the whole process. I did the customer research. Uh, I, I wrote, I edited, I, I had talked to some people who had done similar things before. Like, I really wanted to take a measured approach to this. And I got to. Uh, 
this I made mistakes right off the bat. Uh, 250,000 people come for the first article. Four of them sign up for the newsletter because my, my forms were not very good. So, okay, I got to fix that and, and figure out how I uh, make the forms more prominent or have a better value prop and have a lead magnet and things that I didn't have at the time. I implement that stuff. It starts to go better. I start writing more for search and, you know, the spike of traffic from Reddit starts to decline over time, but the the growth of search continues. So I was eventually bringing in like 30,000 or so people a month pretty consistently, um, which is pretty good for a thing that I did in my spare time when I felt like it. And uh, I got to learn, I got my hands on a lot of stuff. That's when I started using MailChimp and then ultimately Active Campaign, which led me to Active Campaign which was my job after the about two years at the agency. When I, I was looking for something new, I just saw Active Campaign on like a Google business listing. I saw that they were hiring. I was like, oh, I didn't even realize they were in Chicago. Let me check this out. Oh, they're hiring a content marketer for their blog. Let me look at their blog. I can do this. So I, I, you know, I, I spoke to someone who I knew, who knew someone at Active Campaign, had that initial call to get a sense, like, what's the lay of the land, what's happening there. Uh, finally applied, got the interview, got the job, um, and I guess the rest is history. Um, when I came in, Active Campaign was doing about eight thousand organic visitors a month. When I left, it was uh, to the blog. Uh, when I left, it was about two hundred fifty thousand, and that was. Even halfway through my time there, we stopped focusing on it and it just kept sort of growing from the investment we had made. But I come into Active Campaign, hey, write three blog posts a week. That's the mandate. I was like, well, I don't know if that's the way to do it, but I will do that and also optimize them and also reach out to the influencers and also try to distribute them. I was being fairly successful with that. So uh, after eight months or so, I was able to hire someone and be promoted to manager. After another seven or so months, I got to hire three more people. And then with that team of me and four writers, we scaled from, at that point, about 38,000 organic visitors to 119,000 in six months. And that's when the bulk of that work got done um, that, that kept carrying the performance. Because of that, I had more stuff start to come into my team. So I took on video and... I took on community and social, and at some point I had PR for a little bit. It became that I was a little bit of a Swiss army knife where, okay, we have a function that we don't know where to put it for now. We're going to hire someone eventually to manage it, but we, it's not on the roadmap yet, so it has to go somewhere. Benny, you take it, do something with it, <laughs> and someone will, will make it better later. But as a result of that, I got to have my hands on all of these different areas of the business. I touched product market, I touched uh, life cycle, I touched growth somewhat, I did some projections, I did all this stuff that that there was no reason that I had it, <laughs> should have been doing it. I don't, didn't have a background in any of that stuff. But in the same way that that early on, I really wanted to learn everything I could about content marketing. I get handed a new area. All right, let me go find the five smartest people about this. See what they've written. Try to talk to them, uh, and and just hunt down what is going to make an impact here. That eventually led to the the uh, I was director of content, and then I was director of growth as a better reflection of all the work I was doing. And when I came to Podia, it was as, as director of growth and now as a VP of marketing. That's an insane story. And so I'm sure there's people listening to this who are in the first innings of what you shared, right? So you said, hey, I came into Active Campaign. I was a guy that had a successful, a very successful side hustle, but like came into Active Campaign as a fairly junior or mid level IC. Those are my words, not yours, but that's what I heard you say. Came in as an IC and really you were able to increase your impact pretty substantially and your influence came after the impact. Why do you think that was in retrospect? Like, what do you attribute some of that success to? I would say two things. The first is choice of company, which was to some degree luck. I had a sense that I wanted to jump from the agency world to in-house. I had a sense I wanted it to be tech. There were good reasons that I had for thinking those things, but I don't think I, knowing what I knew at the time, was fully cognizant of what it meant to come into a rapidly scaling SaaS company like Active Campaign was at the time. When I joined, I was just after number 200. I don't remember, it was like 208, 210, something like that. And a year earlier, they had been 60. So it was in the middle of this boom, which meant that 
there was more opportunity than there were people to work on the opportunity. And exactly that system that I described where, okay, we have a function that needs doing, but we're trying to hire everything. Like we can't hire it all at once. We, there's just a limit to what we can do uh, in terms of our, our head count. Someone's got to take this on. And by virtue of, of the other thing that I'll say in a second, I think I was often that person. And I really would not underrate the choice of company. I think that's one of the least talked about and most important factors in career success is that if you go to a company that's growing, there will be growth opportunities. It sometimes comes with trade-offs. Uh, sometimes there are growing pains that come with these things. Uh, sometimes taking the opportunity means taking on risk or challenging yourself in ways that that you just don't know anything about the thing you're about to work on. But I, I will always look for a great product in a great market. And do they need to be fast scaling? Not necessarily, but you're never going to have a fast scaling company if you don't have a great product in a great market. And Active Campaign had a great product in a great market. At the time, there was nothing in that mid market for automation. That, that was the power of Marketo almost, but the price of MailChimp, again, almost. Uh, so it, it operate. I mean, Infusionsoft was there, but they were crumbling slowly. I think they're still crumbling slowly. And and I couldn't quite have known that, knowing what I knew it at the time. But I had a sense that it was better than the job I was in, and I was right about that. <laughs> so there was a lot of opportunity coming into a fast scaling business. That's the first thing that I really want to emphasize: that that you're, the environment you're in creates a lot of opportunities for you. Can I pause you there for a second? Totally. So I joined HubSpot almost at the identical time. I joined earlier. I joined in 2011 and they had just hit 200 people, but like the year before there was 50. So like they had just, I think they had just really hit product market fit. They had just raised a big round and I was a part of this new thing. And there's really two types of things that can happen when you join a company like that. Uh, there's your story, which is incredible. And then frankly, there's like my story where I joined HubSpot and I was just a small cog in the big machine and it sort of grew around me, but I didn't necessarily grow rapidly in the way that you're describing. I would imagine that there's folks who are on both sides of this, who are listening to this. Like, why do you think that you were able to, to grow so fast with the company where other folks like me just stayed as like a, a senior IC? I think this ties into the, the other piece, which is if there's something that I'm really good at. It's not that I'm smarter or more confident or harder working or any of those those things. I think, and and I'm speaking sort of, I'm presuming that I'm good at stuff, but I think the thing is that I'm pretty good at changing my mind about deeply held beliefs when presented with evidence to the contrary and even seeking out that evidence. I think there's a lot, especially in marketing, there's a lot of orthodoxy of things that are people assume to be true uh, that isn't necessarily supported by the evidence or, or the, the marketing science that's out there. It's a new field, marketing science. That, and, and the technology that we use changes a lot. Even you know today, Google is super different from what it was when I was uh, doing all this optimization. And the ability to not just accept like, oh, this is how the world works, but continually update my model of this is what is the thing that makes sense or or these are the principles at play or this is how the system works. That to me is the thing that has been most valuable to me because one helps me adapt as things change. And that's both in the broader tech ecosystem as you know, algorithm changes happen and things like that. You know, when when we were starting, Facebook was still a good way to drive traffic in some ways. And that's clearly not true anymore, I guess, if you pay. But even then, also the changing ecosystem within the company you're at, the needs of the company change over time. And you could have some sort of axiom in your head like, oh, retention is the be all and end all. But if it's not the thing that matters to your company and maybe is not even true, you could debate. Uh, <laughs> but it's worth having the debate. Uh, then you are going to be operating and working on stuff that is not the most impactful thing to the company. So that's what I'm always thinking about is how do I have the highest value? Uh, what's the most, I even said this to someone on my team, I'm always asking myself this question. What is the most value 
I can create for the company? What's the, the highest value thing I can work on right now? And a tendency is when I ask people this question is for them to say, oh, well, it's the thing I'm good at. So yeah, I'm a yeah, content yeah, right. marketer. When, when you got the hammer, everything looks yeah. like a nail, right? Classic, yeah. Yeah, I'm the content marketer. It's content is the thing. I'm the paid person. We got to do it, prove our targeting. Our, I'm the lifecycle person. Uh, personalization needs to be better. Like these are the types of things answers people give. And I think one of the things that I tend to be good at is setting aside those preconceptions and trying to look at what is actually here in front of me. And that I think leads me to pursue opportunities that are high impact and then also pursue them in the right way. Because I, I, you know, I I referenced earlier, I'll try to find the five people who are the best at the thing and talk to all of them or read all of them. Um, I'll hunt down what evidence I can find that suggests this path is better than that one and that type of thing. Um, So I think that's really my answer. And it's like sort of an incomplete answer. There's a lot of other stuff that goes into this. And at the end of the day, I would say it really is your choice of company and your ability to to hunt down the areas of most value. I'm curious to know a little bit more about the second point, because a tendency and a pattern that I see a lot is someone comes in, and this is actually maybe more common with like mid-level or even sometimes senior folks, where they come in and they're being hired as the expert, and you almost don't want to admit that whatever you thought or whatever you pounded your fist about could change and might be wrong. And so what I heard you say is really the opposite of that, which is that you kind of don't care where it came from or whose idea it was or what you used to do or what you're good at, that you've been able to take a different approach, which is to learn what the business needs and to prioritize that, even if it's not the thing that you're good at or want to do or was hired for. Is that a learned skill? I could not tell you where that's come from. Uh, <laughs> man, I, don't, I really don't know. There are a number of things in my personal history that are are high skill domains that I've like tried to work at. So I'm thinking like music, like I've played piano my entire life or chess, which is an inherently extremely hard thing. And I've worked at a lot. And, and I think uh, to some degree, the deliberate practice that it took to go through those things sort of filters into other areas where if you start to, in chess in particular, if you start to like say, this is what this is about, and then you're wrong, it feels terrible. And, and it requires like really opening, um, opening yourself up to like, no, this, what's the best thing on the board? It doesn't matter how I feel about it. It doesn't matter anything. There is a best move. And we now know there is because there are computers that can always find it. So nothing matters except what the best move is in that context. So I think it's, it's some, probably something like that, like a, a long-term disposition that I've built up over time um, by pursuing those types of things. And then some of it is the psychology work. Uh, I uh, My area was social and cognitive psych. I've done a lot of research on the psychology of expertise and learning. And to some degree, implicitly, I think that filters into some of my thinking. Um, one of the things you see in a lot of cognitive psych, like the, the like tricky puzzle experiments, are you'll present people with... Um, I'll give just a simple example participants are given this a, a box of matches a candle and a candle and some thumbtacks and they say you have to stick this candle to the wall and light it how do you do that with what you have and what uh no one seems or is very difficult to come up with is the lateral thinking approach of okay well you don't just like plop the candle onto the wall you don't just stick it sideways and hope that the wax somehow sticks it doesn't make any sense you have to empty the box of matches put the box on the wall thumbtack the box to the wall and put the candle on the box. And it requires looking at what you're seeing in a different way from, from how you initially perceived it. And that's a theme that comes up a lot in that type of research. And it's something that I think about a lot when I'm, I'm thinking about marketing. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. So it's getting out of getting out of your lane and breaking your own patterns, which sometimes is hard to do. But what I'm hearing you say is that through other areas and other applications of life, you can learn how to do that. Maybe it's a muscle and yours is a lot stronger through, you know, through your school and through the chess and through probably some other things that you haven't mentioned that you just do intuitively. But that's how folks can build that muscle is just to practice it in other areas of life, maybe. There's a really interesting researcher named Gary Klein who started in the psychology world, but then quickly was frustrated by how lab focused everything was. And it's like, no, you're just like 
showing people things in a room that has a two-way mirror in it, like it doesn't mean that it applies to the real world. I'm going to do all of my research in real world environments. So he's done a lot of that. He's done a lot of work with firefighters and other types of experts. And he's got two books that I recommend. One is Seeing What Others Don't. And the other is Sources of Power, which is not my favorite name. I actually would love for the names to be switched. Um, but the idea is that experts are not sitting there and reasoning through their different options in a scenario. In fact, they almost never do that. It tends to be amateurs that do that because an expert draws on the, the list of things that they've done in the past. They are looking at the situation in front of them and they pull out, oh, well, this is like that situation. This is like that situation. This is like that situation that I've done before. They just see it. And that idea that an expert is someone who just sees the right thing to do is a little bit more applicable in, in, in concrete domains like firefighting than it is in, in more ambiguous things like marketing. But it still sort of applies that you're trying to, when you're working at improving at marketing or growth or whatever you want it to be, you're trying to improve what you see. Because what you see is your model of the situation. So I'm not like trying to reason through all my different things, but I, I'm very cognizant of what is influencing my picture of the situation in the matchbox example. Well, I'm thinking of the matchbox as something other than what it is, which is a box made of cardboard. I'm thinking of it as a thing that holds matches, but it can be something other. If it's a thing, if it's a box of cardboard that has all sorts of uses, it doesn't just have to hold a match. So I have to challenge my preconceptions and see the situation differently. I think that's that's how I tend to think about that. And I recommend it. It's hard to recommend some of this stuff sometimes because some of it is like researchy and dense. But I, I do like uh, sources of power would probably be the one to read for some really interesting stories. And it really challenges the again, the orthodoxy of what is an expert and how do experts think about problems? Do you think that perspective helps you work through unsettling situations? Like just to add a little bit of context to this. When you work, like everybody thinks when you work at a really high growth company that everything's hunky dory and that it must be easy and that <laughs> you just stack promos and the company quarterly reviews are all like high fives and fist pumps and champagne toasts and all that stuff. But in my experience, even when you work at a winner, it sometimes feels bad because the rate of change is unsettling. And you talked about getting all these new jobs and promotions and different responsibilities. Like I could feel your energy. You were excited about that. But I imagine with some folks that leaves them feeling unsettled. Do you think your background and what you were just sharing about looking at things differently and collecting more information helps you through those unsettling moments? It definitely does. And there's actually, here I go again, there's another researcher named Carl Weick, uh, W-E-I-C-K, who his area of research is sense making in organizations. How do organizations learn what is happening? which is a tricky thing because it's how does people learn what's happening, but then how does that, that understanding gets translated throughout the entire company? And he's written a few interesting books about that, but the paper that I'm thinking about right now is called uh, Small Wins, Redefining the Scale of Social Problems. You can find it, uh, you Google that plus PDF, it'll come up, or maybe in Google Scholar. And what he argues is that challenge that, that we face, and I think it applies to high growth companies especially, is the, the task in front of us is massive. And it's, it's very hard to, to parse into its component parts. So when, we, when, when I'm thrown into a situation, it's like, all right, you are now in charge of PR community and social. I don't know anything about PR community and social. I know a couple things, but, but do I? Let me challenge what I know. And then I have to go learn some new stuff. And what he says about that situation is, of course, you don't know. It's very difficult to predict the future. Very smart people work on forecasting still today and are not very good at it. It's an inherently difficult thing to do. And instead of saying, I should know what the big thing is, you take the next step forward. And you act your way into a better understanding of the situation. I describe this by analogy to my teams. Sometimes I recommend this paper all the time because it's pretty short. It's pretty readable. It's still like an academic paper, but it's, it's something that you can read in a single sitting pretty easily. And the analogy that I use with my teams is we are standing at the edge of a swamp that's covered in fog. You can't see anything. And the ground is sticky and there are sinkholes and you could get sucked in and die. 
Um, <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Very, and very relaxing. The other yeah. end, the other end of the swamp, there's a mountain. You can see the mountain. You can see the top of the mountain. It's huge. It's, it peaks up over the fog, and you're trying to get to the mountain. You don't get to the mountain by sitting at the edge and wondering how you're going to do it. There is no way to understand in this context. There's no way to understand what's in the swamp other than to take steps forward. And you got to stick in front of you and you're poking the ground to make sure you don't fall in. But the further you get into the swamp, the more the fog clears around you and the better understanding you have of your situation. So when I think about a high growth environment and the enormous ambiguity that that introduces, anything can happen. And not anything, but a lot of things can happen. You can go in a lot of directions. If you're put in a situation and the, the, the task is figure it out, that's pretty vague and pretty ambiguous. And the first thing you have to do to figure it out, one of the first things you have to do to figure it out is start figuring it out, start doing things and seeing what the response is. When we look at the, the path to the mountain in retrospect, it will look very linear because we have connected a set of discrete dots. But when we're going forward through the swamp, there is an infinite number of paths that we could take. And every step that you take forward uh, narrows the number of paths, which is a scary thing in some ways because it re removes some possibilities, but it's also the only way that you can get to where you're going is to start to take those little actions. Okay, I know that this is good. Start with the part you know, and other things will become clearer around it. So I'm fascinated by this because I speak with people all day long as a coach and really even as an advisor sometimes. And they'll explain to me how they're not sure what to do. And they feel like an imposter because they feel like they should know the answer and that they don't know the answer and they're about to be found out and they're about to be in trouble. And, oh, no, I might lose my job if my, if my founder knows that I don't really know the answer. But what I, just, what I heard you describe is basically, hey, nobody knows the answer. But if we know where we'd like to go roughly and we just keep taking one step, eventually the path will appear in front of us. And I'm curious to know, how do you keep that perspective and not feel the other thing that I've described that I hear a lot from clients? I always look for what is the prevailing evidence-backed uh, perspective in the field I'm looking at. And that's in anything I'm doing. If I'm going to the doctor, I'm, I'm trying to go on PubMed and research my stuff and figure out yeah. <laughs> um, what's wrong with me uh, or what the prognosis is or whatever. And I've had doctors remark on that. It's like, that's unusual. It's like, well, it works for me. <laughs> What's the prevailing evidence back perspective? We're standing at the edge of the swamp, and this is why I caveated it, where the, it's not that the only thing you can do is walk forward. It, you have to at some point, or you're not going to, to make any sort of progress, but you can go and look at people who have done it before. You can look at companies that have done it before. You can try to understand the, the underlying dynamics of the thing you're working on for marketing, um, there, there is marketing science out there that, that is, this is how people buy. And this is um, the messages they pay, pay attention to. And this is how companies grow. And you can hunt out that type of information. Again, not treating it as orthodoxy, um, but, but adding it to your pool of evidence to, to help you understand the situation in front of you. And it helps you make better considered steps into the swamp. Because there are sinkholes, so you don't just want to go charging in. Um, cause you, you know, you could hit something and, and fall in, but you, you have to, at some point, take a step forward and the steps forward you take can be informed by the, the best evidence. So I would say to people like, what's stopping you from going and emailing five people who have done the thing that you've done before. I did that all the time when I was starting an ad to campaign. Uh, I think one of the first people I emailed was Joel Kletke, uh, who's a great copywriter. You probably know him cause he worked on HubSpot. Yeah. Um, I don't know him personally, but I, I know of him. Yeah. Yeah. Joel, uh, Josh Garofalo, who, who worked with Joel on the HubSpot project. Um, a, a, just a lot of people. When I was trying to learn copywriting, I would reach out to all of them. I did calls with a bunch of people. Andy Crestadina, uh, a Chicago local SEO content person who's fantastic he, and, and very generous with his time. And I learned a lot directly from those people where there's a tension there. They're not going to teach you mostly all of the in-depth tactics. And it's very hard for them to translate their model of expertise into your head. So you still have to do a lot of the research and you know read the, the copywriting books or whatever the, the subject is. But what they will do is help you avoid mistakes. 
I did this thing and it was a bad thing. I did this thing and it was a great thing. I wish I had done this differently. And it is just impossible to get that type of information from anywhere else. Um, they also often know other people. They often uh, will be willing to introduce you. Andy is someone like this who is on the pulse of what's happening because he knows everyone and everyone's talking to him all the time. So if you want to go, oh, this is, uh, who's done this thing? Who's done an interesting approach to, I don't know, getting influencers in their content? Oh, well, have you talked to John Benini at Databox, which is how I found out about um, his work. I know that, that y'all are friends as well. And uh, there, there's really like nothing that stops you from taking that step and emailing them. You don't have to write a generic cold email. You can say, hey, I really am really curious about your work. I am in this situation. I would love to, to get your thoughts on this thing. An email is fine. And it, it might uh, turn into a conversation later. Like the worst that they can say is no in that context. And a lot of the time they do say yes, um, just because people like talking about stuff that they're really good at. Yeah, I found the same. And I know that you mentioned this earlier in our combo as something that you attribute some of your success to is right. You leaned on these mentors, both for you to navigate your career and then also using your swamp analogy to figure out what step not to take. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious, even with the help of mentors, I'm pausing because my trash truck's outside. It's uh, Friday's trash day. But so even with all that, you can still fuck it up, right? And you wrote about this. Uh, you wrote in your blog, which we'll link to in the comments, at some point you're going to mess it up. And yep. at some point you're going to mess up bad. But what happens next is what determines whether your mistake shakes people's confidence in you or actually makes them trust you more. And when I read, I actually read this a few times because it just really resonated with me. I'm curious if you can elaborate a little bit more on this and maybe even share if there's a specific story or instance that comes to mind um, that you can share. Yeah, totally. I liked that I started the article that way and I liked starting it that way because everyone has worked with someone who would not take responsibility for a mistake and it was infuriating. You hate working with that person. Stuff goes wrong and they are always pointing fingers. It's never their fault and they're the worst person in the world to work with and it makes every project you do with them later a complete nightmare. What if you did the opposite of that? What if you're the person who always steps up when things go wrong and you are the person who's leading the charge and saying, this is my fault and I'm going to work on this. I, I like to think sometimes like, okay, what if you flip something on its head? This is the way it's typically done and you flip it. What happens? Is it better? Is it worse? It's an interesting just way to think about things. Uh, but this is a model that I used uh, a lot when I think about the the work that I do and mistakes that I make. And if you have a generally strong track record of being a high performer, of working in the best interest of the company, of focusing on those high value tasks, trying to take 100% responsibility when things go wrong is going to reflect really well on you. I lay this out in the article. Step zero is be a really great performer before something goes wrong. And you know you can't fake that. <laughs> um, but step one is take 100% responsibility. And the reason that this is such so powerful is that, of course, you're not 100% responsible. No one is ever 100% responsible for anything. And everyone that you're talking to knows that. So if you have a good track record and you say, this is my fault, this one is on me, we did these things wrong, your boss knows that it's not 100% your fault and values having someone who's going to take ownership of things. Your peers, which is either the most important or second most important group of people you work with, is also going to be like, oh, I'm so glad he's taking the heat on that one. It's only a thing that can help you as long as, again, you have a strong track record of success and you follow the other steps, which are, okay, try to figure out actually what went wrong, be regularly communicating about the progress towards a fix, if it's, especially if it's an ongoing problem, and put measures in place afterwards to prevent that type of mistake from happening again. But again, it starts from taking 100% responsibility. Mistakes that I've made that this applies to there are a few listed in the article. I've uh, I've sent your price is going up emails to people whose price wasn't going up. I accidentally, I remember once I was setting up a lead scoring system and I didn't realize it would retroactively apply the lead score to everyone who had filled the criteria. So as soon as I set up the system, it sent 16,000 emails <laughs> to people who had done it before. Oops. I've actually uh, that done that exact bad. same mistake for what it's worth, that exact yeah, mistake. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, and that's a situation It's like, well, I can't really totally blame myself for that, for how the system works. Maybe I could have known better. I don't know. I'm going to take responsibility for that. It's on me. Uh, and you explain the situation to your boss. and like, yeah, he probably couldn't have known that situation. 
Um, but I'm glad that he's taking responsibility for it and fixing it. It's never going to happen again. Uh, I have sent out press releases that had bad stuff in them. I sent emails with bad links, a, a lot of things like that. Presentations that went poorly or that we were unprepared for or webinars that didn't work. Like th this type of stuff happens like it, operationally. And when you make a, an acute mistake like that, taking responsibility for it is only ever going to help. And you could look at a, a situation. I've been in companies where there was a number and it wasn't hit and everyone is pointing fingers everywhere, right? And I've heard plenty of uh, stories of that type of thing also. And when everyone is pointing fingers, no one is pointing at, at back at the top of the mountain and saying, how do we get there? So if you are willing to take on the responsibility for it, suddenly all the finger pointing goes away. What are they going to do? They point their finger at you, right? And then you get to point your finger at the mountain. It, it really uh, gives you a lot of influence. Again, if you have the track record of being very successful and being a high performer and focusing on the most valuable things, it gives you a lot of influence to say, stop talking about whose fault this is. It's my fault. Now let's fix it. So I, I really think that's a, that's a powerful thing uh, that is not really related to subject matter expertise or anything like that, but is, is something that can uh, help you get what you want in an organization. And there are caveats here also that I think the worst mistakes that you make are not things that are acute like this. They're things that you either do habitually without realizing or don't do, and you really need to like rip off the bandaid and, and take care of them. Um, but when you do make a, an acute mistake like this and it's really bad, take the responsibility and then you can, you, you gain power to point people towards the fix. And is this the system for making a mistake and not letting it become a traumatic event? Like you talked about a specific example that resonated with me, bad presentations. I'm sure that everyone is listening to this has had some flavor of that where you presented something, maybe it's a plan, maybe it's the outcome of something, maybe it's future work that you prioritize and it doesn't go well for whatever reason. And sometimes that can stay with you. Like sometimes that can follow you from like quarter to quarter, sometimes even job to job. Is this the system to letting go of that? Is just taking 100% ownership if you have the track record to do so and then refocusing on the result? I uh, don't know the answer to that. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'd like to think maybe it is, I do think that taking responsibility like that is freeing in a lot of ways because it then opens up the possibilities of what you can do next. So you stop focusing on what went wrong other than to fix it to do the next thing. To some degree, I personally have the sense that if you are operating in a high growth environment and you are tackling things that you've never tackled before and there are stakes, you're going to make mistakes. Always, you'll make mistakes, cannot be prevented. In fact, if you're not making mistakes, you are making the worst mistake, which is that you're not tr taking on enough stuff and you're not uh, uh, hunting out the opportunities that are high value, even if they're not directly in your wheelhouse. So with that understanding, as long as you are focused on, or for me, this is how I think about it, as long as I'm focused on the highest value opportunities, the little mistakes don't matter that much. I've commented before, and we've sort of been dancing around the same idea. In high growth orgs, it is remarkable how much can go wrong, and you still have an incredible company because you yeah, have a great true. product in a great market. And those are the most important things. You're trying to fuel that core growth engine of the company. If little stuff goes wrong, it's going to go wrong. You just have to focus on what is the most impactful thing. And you know, we don't want to be frantic. We don't want things to break all the time. There, there are caveats to this and everything, but at its core, like what's the most important thing that you can be focusing on? And if you make mistakes, it's going to happen in the pursuit of that most valuable thing. But if you're making progress towards it, the, the value you create outweighs the mistakes you make. So that makes sense when it's an acute mistake. You talked about the other types of mistakes maybe being worse, yeah, right? So it's not, the, it's not the pothole that you stepped in, but it's maybe the a thousand little things that you've been doing or not doing. How does someone identify and improve on those things? I think you have to get feedback and that can be really hard. The ongoing things are the things that people are least likely to give you feedback on. And it's also the stuff that leads to like insecurities and some degree of imposter syndrome where uh, your boss isn't going to tell you like, oh, they just are never convincing when they're presenting. And to get that feedback can be really crushing also. So I think if you have a boss who's willing to give you feedback on these specific things in a way that, that you can take it uh, and, and learn from it, that's really valuable. 
I, I have a few in my head of, of um, common things that I see that are holding people back without them necessarily realizing it, which is part of the reason I started this whole newsletter. Um, taking mis- responsibility for mistakes would be one of them. No one's going to tell you you should take 100% responsibility for mistakes and you didn't there uh, in, a, in a work situation. I also think that that reading a lot or hunting out expert perspectives is helpful because it gives you a model of what a successful person or what success in your role looks like, which makes it easier to work towards that. As a manager, some of the mistakes you make are deferring hard conversations and you're not always going to know within, I mean, you'll know that something is wrong because you're going to feel it all the time. You're like, oh God, do I tell this person about it or not? Like, oh man, what do I do? But your, your boss isn't necessarily going to tell you. They might not necessarily be aware of a low performer on your team or they might be aware, but they might be letting you decide or they might not think about it at all. They're not going to tell you that it's time to have that conversation. They're not going to tell you about, uh, about how you give feedback to people. They, they won't see a lot of it. So you have to hunt out a model of, of what good looks like. And that makes it a lot easier to, to do some of these things. Um, but there are a lot of, of habitual mistakes that people make. Uh, there are things that you don't do, like I really should be pursuing this thing that is higher value, but instead I'm staying with this tool set that I know really well. And that's a very common thing that people do. And there are things that you do. Uh, one example is that I think is pretty common also is you hear an idea from someone and your first instinct is absolutely not. No way. Uh-uh. Not doing that. That's incredibly stupid. Marketers hear this all the time. Everyone who's in a management position in a marketing team has it from their boss or their peers or the, the developers or the support team or HR or anyone, sales, like what, what marketing should be doing. But if you slam the brakes on every conversation, people are going to stop coming to you for stuff. And there are ways to not do the thing that you've been asked to do that someone is coming to you with an idea that is not slamming the brakes on the conversation. And uh, I think that's one of the more common mistakes I see is that people are like, and, and it's common advice also, you have to learn to say no. Yes, you have to learn to say no, but you have to say, learn to say no while saying yes. <laughs> um, and while, while uh, yes anding the idea and understanding where the person is coming from and, and seeing, oh, maybe we can solve that with something we have, or I really want to work with you on it and figuring out um, what the best path forward is. And then ultimately, maybe we can't do anything and it's a no, but they feel like you listen to them and you, you exhausted all the possibilities. So I think that's a really common thing that people run into also. And I have a few articles about that same idea. Um, but it's mistakes like that, that, who is anyone going to tell you that, that you're a hard person to pitch ideas to? I don't think they are. Um, so it takes some self-awareness and some, um, some self-education and hunting out that type of resource to, to avoid that, that type of situation. I'm curious if you're comfortable to share what's been the hardest feedback that someone has shared with you personally. I've had a couple that, that were just, uh, see, the, this is part of, I think, where one of my strengths comes in, where when I get feedback like this and it's accurate feedback, my response is not like, damn, oh, I'm so stupid or something like that. Or, oh, man, this crushes my whole world for you. It's like, oh, man, that person is right about that, huh? Um, and I actually love those moments because it means that I have incorporated some knowledge from outside of my model of how the world works. And it, it broke a little bit, which means I got to update my model of how the world works and everything gets better. I have a specific example. I'm not just going to talk in generalities. Um, one that, that simple one that comes to mind is I actually went into to Andy Crestadina uh, shortly after I started Active Campaign and I showed him one of my first posts and he scrolled through it and he went, I've seen you do better than this. Ouch. Ouch. As like, oh man, but how, yeah. what powerful feedback is, is that? Because he, he was right. He had seen me do better than that on my own personal blog that he had, he'd also um, given feedback on. And he phrased and, it in a way that made him, that yeah. made you feel like he believed in you, right? It wasn't like, hey, this is crummy work. It was, and I've seen you do better, yeah. right? So it wasn't just putting you down. It was letting you know that you had more capability than you showed here. So he yep. did it in a savvy way. He's, he's a great, like very generous, uh, kind person. I think uh, Joel, Joel actually, Joel Klecki described him as the Keebler elf of the marketing world. Uh, just the nicest guy. <laughs> uh, check out Orbit Media Studios. That's my plug for Andy. <laughs> uh, but 
the other piece of of advice or feedback is a little bit more general. Uh, when I was at Active Campaign, as I mentioned, we scaled from eight thousand to we'll pause at one hundred nineteen thousand. So we eventually went to two fifty, but we followed the approach that got us there through one hundred nineteen thousand organic visitors a month to the blog. And at that point is when other teams started to come into my team, and it was a okay, video is there, and some product marketing is there, and some. Uh, you know, I had SEO, uh, I had uh, corporate, I had communications and social, uh, uh, sorry, community and social, I guess communications also to some degree. And, and all these other pieces were coming in and it required a shift in how I thought about marketing, where I was thinking very much about these numbers are going up and that's good. And it was good. But the CMO at the time was good about prompting me that you have to create things that are larger than the sum of their parts. And the content is a great part and the part itself is improving massively. But now you have influence beyond the five person team that you have, you have, you know, whatever, 13 person team in a 60 person marketing org, that's a substantial amount of influence, you can drive a lot more than what you're driving just with your team. Uh, There were a bunch of management things in here. Also, it's not that uh, your team is actually not your first team. Your peers are your first team. And maybe even your boss is your first team. And that that's- is a powerful lesson in itself. It took somebody yeah. pulling me aside and explaining that uh, before yeah. and it really hit me over the head with it. So that's powerful. Yeah. Managers spend so much time with their direct reports and the people on their team when really they got to be working across the organization. And that's where the power of management comes in. And uh, to have someone explain that to you is, is incredible <laughs> before you make the mistake in a pretty major way. So that, that was a pretty significant one. Um, you have to be thinking about h- how you create things that are going to travel across the organization without you being there to explain them, which is a really powerful uh, idea also. Like, oh, if I make a deck, it has to stand alone. It can't be something that I present because it will be shared across the executive team. And anyone has to look at it and come to the same conclusion that I want them to come them to uh, want them to come to. So there were a lot of those like internal marketing things, this idea of you can actually use these big mo- marketing moments to drive the performance across the channels. And that feedback is in some ways very hard because it required me to shift how I thought about most things marketing, uh, or I should say most things about how marketing operates um, because the, you know the underlying things about great product and great market and copywriting and value proposition, all of that is, is the same across this. Um, but it, it taught me a lot about how marketing operates within an organization and it's hard feedback because it challenges what you believe. Makes sense. You're getting this feedback. You're expanding your influence. I actually want to dig in a little bit and explore a slightly different angle of something that you just shared. So you just talked about as you grew your content engine, you started getting a bunch of other responsibilities basically. And I think this is a really common one. When someone has risen quickly at a company, all of a sudden everybody just throws stuff at them. And then at yeah. some point in time... <laughs> The cup overflows, you know, it spills over and they start feeling bad. Like things are going well, but it doesn't feel good on the inside. And I'm wondering at this point for you, if that happened or if it didn't happen, how you managed it. It did happen. It took about a year and a half, I think, before it it started to, to really hit me. And I did not manage it especially well, is sort of the answer to that question. And I think... This was something that I I have since gone to people in similar organizations and talked to them about their experiences. And it seems like a very common one, but before it happening, I I was not on top of it. So I was surprised and and not ready to deal with it. What I think often happens from my conversations and from what happened to me is that high growth orgs hire very quickly and they hire without a strong understanding of the core growth model of their business, which grows their marketing teams a lot, which leads to a lot of activity happening. And maybe there are channel specific KPIs and maybe some of those numbers start to increase and they do well and some channels do well and some teams do well, but there's a limit to what you can do with that approach. It gets harder as the numbers get bigger to improve 10%, um, to improve 20%, to improve 60% year over year. Uh, and you're going to hit a wall. And uh, we're seeing actually now as the economy is is shaky, a lot of these companies who have never not grown are hitting this wall in a pretty major way because they don't have a really strong understanding of, of what their real value proposition is for their market. 
and they have not structured their their business to grow through that value proposition. But you operate in that type of organization as a high performer who has had a lot of success running these channels. And then the channels start to slow down because you've reached the stage of growth where it's hard to keep adding incrementally. And the org doesn't know how to deal with that. Everyone freaks out. Everyone has a ton of ideas. You've brought on a lot of people. So you've introduced a lot of communication debt. And uh, you as the person who is the Swiss army knife can wind up at the center of a lot of things. People come to you for a lot of stuff. I, I described it. I don't remember if I did this in the post I uh, wrote about it or if I've just said it in conversation, but I've described it as uh, you are being drawn and quartered. Like you have you have ropes attached to each limb and you're being pulled by horses and it takes a lot of energy to not get pulled apart, but you're also not going anywhere. And that's what that starts to feel like. I am using uh, all of the the skills I have at my disposal and I'm doing my best and I'm working a lot and maybe even working more than I was six months or a year ago and I'm making no progress. And that feels absolutely terrible to someone who's used to making a lot of progress. So in the situation I was in, I ultimately concluded that, and this is hard for someone, and I wrote, wrote about this also, this is I think why people have this feeling. It's hard when you are someone who takes a lot of responsibility for things. I think these things are my responsibility and I'm not able to drive them. I ultimately concluded that change that needed to happen needed to happen higher up in the organization than I was personally going to be able to drive it. There were mismatches between the sales org in the market and even the marketing org in the market and what the product is building. And, and actually, the company has made a lot of a lot of changes uh, since I left that, uh, from what I hear uh, internally, have, have been awesome. And the company was ultimately great to me and made my career. Uh, but it takes a lot to, to recognize that. And it took me probably six months of being pretty burnt out to, to realize that that was going on and that I really could not change how things were going to operate. And I had to leave. Do you have any advice for someone who might be going through something similar? Maybe they don't bring it home with them. That was something that I always struggled with. Uh, you know, your analogy of being pulled in different directions really resonates with me. Like I, I've described that to folks, like literally with my arms wide, just like what you did on our yep. call here. Um, <laughs> And I took it home with me and I was stressed and like, I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about stuff and it shook my confidence sometimes because I felt like I was in the epicenter of it, me, right? Like the ego got in there and I, I thought it was kind of on me and that I wasn't doing a good job. Did you struggle with something similar? Like, did you take it home with you at the end of the night? Yeah. I, if someone figures out how to not do that, they are incredible and have done a whole lot of meditation, <laughs> but I don't <laughs> hey man, know. I meditated to... for years and I, it still is it, it, it enough for that stuff. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to say, oh, it's five o'clock, brain, stop, right? Like, don't think about this anymore. It's something you put a lot of work into. It's something you put a lot of effort into. And you're going to face again at nine o'clock the next morning, if not earlier. And maybe five o'clock is ambitious to stop, right? So I don't really know how to not take that home with you. Maybe if I were to, if I were in a situation like that again, this is where my head goes so as we've been talking about it. If I were in a situation like that again, and I, I concluded that it is worth it to endure the stress of this, to experience the, the opportunities that it's going to bring, I don't know how likely I am to reach that conclusion, but hypothetically it's possible. What I would probably do is seek out very high stress uh, uh, professions outside of marketing, nurses, doctors, those types of people, and understand uh, how do those types of people manage this type of transition. So again, like, let me look outside the field of marketing. Let me go find the people who experience this all the time, because there are a whole lot of nurses out there um, who see a whole lot of shit on a daily basis. Um, and there must be some some sort of literature about it. So that's, that's where my head goes when I think about dealing with this type of stuff. I've never I have not actually looked into that stuff because I, I don't have to right now. I don't know how to not bring it home with you. I think that people often struggle in these types of situations. And I wrote about this in the in the article that I wrote on this topic because they feel a lot of ownership and they feel like they are influential and skilled and capable of changing things when it's not really, there's a system that is around them that is too big for an individual to change. Um, even the individual at the top is going to have to be really careful about how they change a broken system like that to avoid introducing other problems. Uh, and when you talk to these people, and I was this way too, always changes two weeks to three months away. Always. 
Yeah, it's true. We are working on this project. And I think, I really think that's going to get the ship right. We are working on this thing and then our fundamentals are going to be in place. We are working on this thing. And then if this person is going to stop bothering me for stuff because we have our whatever intake form or something. It's always, every single time there's a project that's going on and it's two weeks to three months away, which is just the right amount of time to make you think that it's coming soon and there's hope. <laughs> but it's brutal in a lot of ways because outside of major changes happening to the system of an organization, it, that that is that thing really going to have the effect or do you just want it to? And I think those are those are hard conversations to have with yourself. There are flip sides where I've had conversations with two people recently, both at high growth orgs, uh, one where the there was a VP of marketing who was fired and then they operated rudderless for a long time. And he was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm getting opportunities and I'm one of these people who's taking opportunities, hunting for value, and that's leading to good things, but it's also leading to more things and we're still very siloed. Then they bring on an SVP of marketing and it's been great. And it, it's, it's exactly the layer that marketing needed between them and the CEO. And he's still getting a lot of the opportunities, but he's not having a, a lot of the problems. And that's awesome and amazing that that system worked out. Another person had a CMO who was, a, by this person's uh, description, a total nightmare, a, a classic case of filling up and would go off and have random ideas and spend money on weird campaigns without telling anyone on the team and and just had no idea what they were doing. And then they replaced them with the CMO who is incredibly competent, uh, runs down, all right, these are the three priorities for the entire marketing organization. That's what we're focusing on. and. Uh, has organized the team in an amazing way. So it's possible for these systems to change, but neither of those is the manager or director level person, the one who's changing it. It's always, it's the CEO bringing in someone uh, at the top of that organization who's able to make, have that impact. So if you're in this situation, a lot of the time people are uncomfortable leaving because I feel like I can make a difference. I feel like change is two weeks to three months away. I don't want to leave my coworkers in the lurch, right? That doesn't seem fair or fun. And at some point you have to ask yourself, what would make you feel comfortable leaving this company? Are you holding on to something because of how much work you've put into it? Is there anything where you would say, it's time for me to go? And if you ask that question, you start to think like, huh, this is not like a choice that I've made. This is uh, something that I can't let go of. And I would prompt someone who is feeling burnt out or, or who is being pulled in a lot of directions to ask that type of question of themselves so that they can make whatever decision they need to, need to make with, with clear eyes. Dude, I just want to say thank you for coming on and sharing some of your thoughts and some of your experiences here. For those who are listening want to learn more about your takes on leadership or just want to connect with you, where can we direct them to? For now, I'm on Twitter. We'll see how if Twitter is still alive when this podcast goes up. But uh, <laughs> I am I'm at Benjamin Elias on Twitter. And you can also, I've mentioned and we've mentioned uh, articles I've written. You can get that at diamondpencils.substack.com. Why diamond pencils? Because uh, it's all about soft skills and everyone talks about hard skills, but if you try to write with a diamond pencil, you're not going to get very far. So diamondpencils.substack.com. That's all about the soft skills that make people successful at work. Put a link to it in the show notes. I actually was wondering myself, I read a whole bunch of your content uh, <laughs> before today. And then obviously to prep a little bit for our combo today. Uh, and there's a lot of good stuff there, even for me to brush up on my leadership skills. So check it out. Thank you for coming on. Really appreciate the time, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Hell yeah. Thank you for listening to the pod. I hope that you enjoyed the episode. If you did, I have an ask. The biggest gift that you could give me as a small business owner and as a content creator would be a review. You know the game. You can go on to Apple Podcasts. You can go on Spotify. Leave a review. That would help me service this content to other folks who are like you. Obviously, you should subscribe to the content if you really dug it. And if there's feedback that you have for me, folks you think I should chat with, stuff that you wish I would gloss over faster, whatever it is. I'm all ears. I work in growth. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I, I try to collect feedback and iterate quickly. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn at Andrew Kaplan or on Twitter at at A Otherwise, hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll see you next show.